I do uh, appreciate and thank you all for allowing me to come tonight and to be able to uh, present God's word uh, for us all here. Um, as a quick update on the internship that I'm doing here at Evangel, um, it's going well. I've been working with the youth group and alongside Brian and Rachel and Krista and Boris and the other leaders uh, to be able to uh, minister to the teens and to be able to help them grow in their discipleship process. And it's just been a awesome, awesome time. I don't want to give away too many surprises, so that's why I will not tell you what the projects I'm working on just yet. So those will be coming up in the months to follow. Um, but before I begin, uh, let's open with prayer. Dear Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for the time that we can dive into your word. Um, that when we sin against you, that you are faithful and just to cleanse us of all sin and to purify us with your righteousness. We thank you, Lord, for the life of Peter as one that we can often relate to in messing up and really kind of making a fool of ourselves. But you showed your patience to him and you continue to show your patience to us. Lord, I pray that you would continue to show us our sin, but show us our Savior and how much greater our Savior is. We thank you for this time and we pray that you would open our hearts, open the eyes of our hearts, that we would understand what you have from your word and that we would seek to apply it in our lives. In your holy name we pray, amen. So I have a question. Have you ever really biffed it? And I mean where you fell flat on your face. After my first year of college, it was my, after my first freshman year in college, I thought it would be good to go home and I was going to teach for the youth group. And now I had just had a class called Principles of Bible Study. And I thought, okay, like I learned how to do like Greek word studies and stuff, so this will be, this will be fun. Like I'll be able to kind of show off a little bit what I've learned and everything and wow the youth group. And I had PowerPoint. I, again, I did some Greek word studies. I had some awesome illustrations. It, was, it couldn't go wrong. And when Wednesday night came, I got up and immediately an unknown kind of a weird fear took over and I just fell flat on my face. I forgot my points. The illustrations I sped through, I basically read my PowerPoint, which is a carnal sin. You never, ever do that. And while I was up there, my message was so convicting to me that I felt even inadequate to preach it. And after a five quick, agonizing minutes, I finished and sat down with my head looking straight into the ground. And all I could think about is, how could I ever preach again? I mean, how could I recover? Maybe I could see about trying to be uh, something else, maybe a fireman or something. <laughs> but how many times have we felt like that before? I don't know, maybe yours wasn't like that, but maybe when you first met your spouse, you'd just taken them out to this awesome place and you didn't choose a greasy spoon, but like you got like a sandwich and you dropped a nice good blob of mustard or mayonnaise on your shirt. Or better yet, maybe you're in a, a meeting and you know your boss for years, but for some reason you call him by his wrong name in front of everybody and you do it repeatedly. Or maybe, um, or maybe it could be even as simple as accidentally dropping your phone in the toilet. And some of those mistakes and those failures that kind of haunt us from there. But maybe more on a serious note, maybe we snap at our kids or our spouses. Maybe we keep trying to take control of a situation instead of trusting in God's wise hand. Maybe we fail to be a faithful witness and an opportunity that God has given to us. Or maybe we keep committing the sin of blank and we fall flat on our faces. And we ask, how can I recover from this? 
And on your seats, or actually when you came in here, you should have received a red heart. If you actually have that red heart, please hold it up. And if you haven't got it, well, actually, I probably should have had those of you who didn't get the red heart raise your hand, so it would be a little bit easier. Okay, there's one. Okay. Does anybody else need one? Okay. So we all, oh, you actually, okay, we need one. We need two. Okay. There we go. Okay, here, I got a stack right here. Should cover everybody then. Okay, so we're going to be using this for the sermon tonight. And so what I want you to take is take that red heart out, and I want you to write on it what is a sin that constantly plagues you. And again, you might not want to write this where the person next to you can see it, but this is supposed to be just for you personally. But write something that constantly keeps coming up that maybe Satan keeps digging at. And is constantly saying, hey, like, remember that? And I want you to write that. And then I want you to tuck it back in your Bible, and we're going to be saving it from later. So I'm going to give you a chance to do that. Write something that keeps on coming up, that maybe Satan keeps on digging at and stuff, and tells you, remember what you did yesterday? So. And while you're doing that, I actually originally had titled this sermon, God's Love is Greater Than Our Greatest Failure. But I recently have been convicted of the fact that what we often call failures and mishaps, things that keep us from growing in our walk with Christ, are often called by another name, and it's sin. Sin is an open-handed, rebellious act against God that was conducive to our former way of life. And a friend of mine reminded me of Oswald Chambers' description, is sin is not a defect, but it's a red-handed mutiny against God. And when we remember that's the standard, that when we say, like, oh, like, I failed, no, we actually sinned. And we realize our need, we see our sin, and we see our need, we need a Savior. And when we choose to use that word, it communicates the importance that we really did mess up and we need intervention. And so many of these thoughts tonight have probably been cycling through Peter's mind when he denied Christ. And tonight we're going to look in John 21, 15 through verses 19. And we're going to look at three observations of how God's love is greater than our greatest sin. And while you're turning there, to set up the, the surrounding text here, it actually begins in chapter 18. So Jesus has just been betrayed, and he's standing before the Sanhedrin. Peter is able to make it into the inner court to be able to see what's going on. And as he's warming his hands by a fire, we have a man comes up and says, I think I've seen you with Jesus before. And Peter's initial response is, no, I, I don't know him. Then a woman comes up to him and says, wait a minute, I've seen you before with him. And he starts to get more irritated. I do not know him. Then finally, a small servant girl comes up to him and says, I've seen you. I know you were with Jesus. And he calls down curses saying, I do not know him. And immediately he locks eyes with Jesus and he hears the rooster crowing in the background. All of that talk of, Jesus, I will go to death if that's what you need me to do. But when a small servant girl comes up and says, were you with Jesus? He kind of folds. And we see here this failure and stuff, and we're like, whoa. And now fast forward, Jesus has died and rose again, and he has appeared to the disciples two different times now before, and he has just revealed himself a third time to the disciples by giving them a huge catch of fish, very similar to that of what he did when he first called them. And they're sitting around a fire enjoying breakfast, and this is where we come into the narrative. And the text says here, starting in verse 15 of John 21. So when they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? And he said to him, 
Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, Tend my lambs. He said to him again a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And he said to him, Yes, Lord, you you know that I love you. And he said to him, Shepherd my sheep. And he said to him a third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And Peter was grieved because he said to him a third time, Do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know all things, and you know that I love you. And Jesus said to him, Tend my sheep. The first observation we see here in the text is in verses 15 down through 17. Is The first thing is that God's love pursues us. If we can think back through Peter's history, we constantly see God, we see Christ initiating the conversation. We see that Christ comes and he is the one that calls Peter. There's some other instances where even when Jesus calls Peter to walk out on the water, Peter just doesn't jump out of the boat and stuff in the middle of a storm, but Christ actually says, come out here. And Peter walks out and falls through the water. And we see Jesus also asks, who do you say I am? And Peter confesses that he is the Christ, and he does well. And then a couple minutes later, he's he's speaking the words of Satan. And then Jesus dies for Peter. We see Jesus meets Peter on the shore, and Jesus starts the conversation. Jesus initiates. He begins the restoration process for Peter. He doesn't wait for, for Peter to come and apologize But he begins with these questions of, do you love me? And we see God's love constantly pursuing us as well. We see in John 10, 1 through 21 as a prime example of the parable of the lost sheep, where a shepherd pursues the sheep no matter what the cost. We had our own version of this on Thursday. Um, We had, we were babysitting, or not babysitting, dog sitting, Uh, a friend of ours, uh, Boston Terrier and Pug mix, so a very cute dog. Um, And on Thursday morning and stuff, we let the dog out to do its business and everything, and it saw a rabbit and started chasing it. And now our yard is normally fenced off and everything and stuff, so this this is okay. But what we didn't know was the side gate for was open. And so this dog goes and books it out of our yard. And this is at 6 o'clock in the morning. It's pretty dark out. And the dog is pretty much all black. So safe to say we were a little concerned. And for the next two, three hours, we're calling her. We're blowing on whistles. We're walking up and down the streets, asking people, where have you seen her and stuff. We're going through with flashlights around, and we're still coming up with nothing. And then finally we get a call that that someone has her and they saw her tag and they called. And so we go over and we find her. And the relief that we had of finding this dog and bringing her back safely and unharmed. And we see that's God's loving pursuit of us. It's relentless. But it relentlessly pursues us to repentance. It doesn't just leave us in our sin, but it calls us to repent. It calls us to begin restoration. And that's the second observation we see in the text here, that God's love pursues us relentlessly, but it pursues us with a point to restore our relationship with Christ. We see here again in verse 15 that Jesus says, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? We see here in the conversation, Jesus asks Peter, do you love me more than these? Now, some commentators would say this is referring to Peter's former life in fishing. It's something he knew. When Jesus was risen from the grave, I wonder if Peter also was like, well, I betrayed the Son of God. I don't think I'm qualified to be his disciple anymore or be his apostle anymore. So maybe, maybe I should just go back to fishing. I'm good at that. And we also see that Jesus keeps on bringing Peter back to his prior commitment and where he says, 
everyone else will deny and run away, but I won't, Lord. And Jesus was bringing him back to that former commitment. And we notice here that Jesus basically recreates the same situation. He's surrounded by people around a fire, and Jesus is asking, Peter, do you love me? Do you know me? And we see here that constantly Christ is working to restore Peter. And especially here in the conversation, something that surprised me in this study was the usage of the word love here, or at least what we would see. Jesus uses the word agape, which is usually the idea of unconditional, total commitment, love. But Peter's response, and this is in the Greek, we see Peter's response is the word phileo, which is what we get as more of a family, brotherly affection love. And Jesus uses again agape, saying, Peter, do you totally love me? And Peter's response again is, Yes, I, I love you. I, I, I care for you like a family member. And Peter's response again is this phileo, and this is one commentator suggests that because Peter was thinking about his sin possibly, that he didn't want to up, front, up in front of everybody make the claim, yes, I, can, I, I totally love you, Jesus, without any resolve. Because that's what he did last time, and what if he, and he failed and he didn't want to do that again? But then Jesus then does something different here. He changes the words. So the first two times Jesus uses the word agape, do you totally commit, committedly love me? But the third time Jesus asks Peter, do you love me? He uses phileo. And I wondered why would Jesus do this? And one commentator implies this, that Jesus went from, Peter, do you love me with total commitment to, Peter, do you love me at all? Do you really love me? And when Peter hears this, he breaks down. And he says, Lord, you know I love you. And Jesus, through questioning Peter, he takes him from, again, recreating his failure of three times someone saying, hey, do you know this guy? And him denying it. And Jesus takes Peter again through and says, do you love me each of these times? And he does this because he wants to show Peter, hey, that you do love me with an undying commitment. He takes him through his past failure and shows him, hey, because of my pursuing love for you, that's how you can move forward. And now we see here, interesting, there we go. And with Peter's answer of, you know that I love you, Jesus doesn't just leave him there, but he actually gives him responsibility. If someone were to fail, um, if they had to work or something with us, you'd be kind of leery about giving that person responsibility. But we see here Christ has the opposite idea here. When Peter is restored, he doesn't keep Peter at like, okay, maybe we'll wait like a year or two, and then we'll see, like, are you still good? And then, okay, we'll, we'll give you some responsibility. No, Peter is given, hey, I want you to tend, I want you to shepherd my sheep. And constantly, Jesus is saying here, um, and he's giving him this responsibility. What is cool is Peter remembers this fact, this restoring act, because he hints to it in his own letter to the exiles. In 1 Peter 4, 8, he says, keep fervent in your love, because love covers a multitude of sins. And to think about that, Peter may have thought back to, wow, I denied Christ, and yet Christ pursued me, and he restored me. So really, love does cover a multitude of sins. My uncle had actually passed away three years ago or so. And when we were kind of preparing the house to be able to sell, it was kind of in a rough shape. And we did the best we can, but honestly, there was only so much we could do. And there was a buyer that was interested in it. They wanted to remodel it and everything. And my first response was, good luck, 
because it's, it's in kind of a, a, rough, a rough shape right now. And just recently, I was actually driving by that same house, and I was surprised and shocked on how well it looked. Old like shrubs that were uh, just not really that good looking were completely removed. The lawn was cut. I could see they were doing renovations on the house, and it looked amazing. And we see here that Christ was working on restoring Peter, not just to where he was, but he was wanting to make him better. And that's that same pursuing, restoring love that God has toward us as well. That he doesn't want to keep us where we failed or we messed up, but he wants us to be pursuing Christ even further. And God's love restores us so we can see his perfecting work in us. And this is the third and final observation. First, God's love pursues us. Secondly, God's love restores us. And thirdly, God's love is perfecting us. And in verses 18 through 19, we see this. Truly, truly, I say to you, when you were younger, you used to gird yourself and walk wherever you wished. But when you grow old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will gird you and bring you where you do not wish to go. Now this was to signify what kind of death he would glorify God. And when he had spoken this, he said to him, follow me. And, just, and Jesus tells Peter that he would glorify God. And imagine that. Imagine you just betrayed the Son of God. You denied him. And then you see that after this time period, Jesus comes, he pursues you, he restores you. But not only that, he actually says, you'll actually be able to be used of God. You actually will succeed. You will actually bring God glory. Going from denying Christ to actually being able to point back to see how awesome God really is. To see that drastic change. Christ speaks of the Holy Spirit here that would help Peter obey in verse 18 where it says that where you used to gird yourself and used to walk where you wished, But when you grow old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will gird you and bring you where you do not wish to go. And you see that it was the Holy Spirit's work that would be helping Peter to do what he couldn't do on his own. Where Peter was afraid to potentially go to his death for Christ. The Holy Spirit would help him do that in the future. By submitting to the Holy Spirit, God's love would work through Peter, perfecting him and helping him fulfill his commitment. And in verse 19, it talks about Peter would be crucified. And according to church tradition, he was crucified, but upside down. And we see that God's perfecting love can also be thought about as the construction of the Michelangelo statue of David. When a patron asked him, how did you know what to chip and what not to chip? He simply replied, I chipped whatever didn't look like David. And that's how God's perfecting love was with Peter and is with us. He is constantly working through our submission to perfect us, to chip away what doesn't look like Christ. So the end result is that we would be more like him, that we would image Christ. After this conversation, Peter still has his hiccups. We see with Cornelius where he's kind of still holding on to, okay, what are the Jewish traditions that I have? And even Paul confronts him about this later in Galatians. But even, and even also right after this conversation, but God does something miraculous with Peter in Acts 4.13. If you can Keep your finger right here and just flip over a couple pages to Acts 4.13. And now, a little bit of a background. This is right after Pentecost, where Peter stands before thousands coming to know Christ. And they had just healed a lame man. And the Sanhedrin, more than likely the same people that put Jesus to death, had Peter and John arrested and brought before them. 
And they ask them, by whose power are you doing this? Now again, these are the people that have the authority and the power to put Peter and John to death. And what is their response? Now, er, and we see here, and it says, now as they observed the confidence, Peter and John and understood they were uneducated and untrained men, they were amazed and began to recognize them as having been with Jesus. And we see Peter's response actually back up into verse 10. Let it be known to all of you, to all of the people of Israel, that by the name of Jesus Christ the Nazarene, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by this name, this man stands here before you in good health. If you look at this, it's just amazing to see Peter, one who flinched and denied Christ, is now the one that is standing right before the Sanhedrin saying, you crucified the Son of God. How in the world does someone go from denying Christ to actively condemning the people that put Jesus on the cross? And it's because the Holy Spirit was working in Peter. It's because God's perfecting love in Peter's life. You see, Peter saw that God's love for him was greater than his sin. And what about you? Maybe you're, you feel like Peter and you feel defeated. Maybe you're still struggling with that sin of snapping at your kids or snapping at your spouse or whatever it might be. The thing that keeps on coming up that you have on that red card. And so what I want you to do is to take out that red heart again, actually. And what I want you to do first is to cross out that sin. And on the other side, I want you to write this simple phrase, is that God's love is greater than my greatest sin. So first cross out that sin, whatever you put there, and write, God's love is greater than my greatest sin. And what I want you to do is to take this and put it where you'll see it repeatedly. Put it in your Bible, put it in your glove compartment of your car, which, or you could put it wherever it might be. Maybe put it next to a sticky note that you have. But have it to be a constant reminder, either when we sin, that yes, we must repent and we must seek that restoration in our relationship with God. But also remember that we don't have to stay there that God's love is greater than our greatest sin. Imagine what it would be like if we went through our day-to-day lives knowing regardless of our sins, we believed that God's pursuing, restoring, and perfecting love was greater than our greatest sin. What if we chose to remember that our standing with God is not based on our performance, even in our sanctification, that God is constantly moving and working in us. Imagine the joy and the relief that we would have. Imagine if we went to work, our kids' soccer games, our hair appointments, and the conversations we had with people, and they saw the peace that we have that we know for certain that because of God's pursuing, restoring, and perfecting love, that we can know our sin was paid for and that God is constantly working us and chipping us to look more like Christ. That we're no longer defined by our sins, but by the love our Heavenly Father has shown us in Christ. That who I was is not who I am anymore. So let's close this time with prayer. Dear Father, thank you for this day and thank you for, again, showing us our sin but also showing us our greater Savior. Thank you that you worked through the life of Peter in restoring him even in the midst of his greatest failure. But you also are working in our lives in the everyday situations to make us more like your Son. 
Lord, I pray that you would help us to think through of what you want us to do. What's the next step we need to take in our walk with you to pursue holiness with our whole being. And we pray that you would give us the grace to do so. In your holy name we pray. Amen. All right, um, as we close tonight, uh, just encourage you to spend a few minutes uh, it, here or, or somewhere, grab a, a couple of people and spend some time in prayer together. And then uh, when you're done, you can uh, leave as you will. Uh, the stories, I believe, will be out in the, the lobby area. So if you didn't get a chance to ask any questions that maybe you wanted to ask during the uh, Sunday school hour this morning, grab them out there in the lobby, have a, a conversation with them. And, and uh, so I guess we'll... We'll dismiss the prayer here. All right.